Good morning, everyone. This morning, um, we arrived way earlier, not even on time, but we were earlier, and I was getting really nervous. What will I do in, <laughs> in this half an hour that I have? And so, but it has been good that we have had this little time frame to be able to greet and to hug each one of you, hopefully. If not, please come later. I would love to hug you <laughs> and to say hello. So. We, are, we still have quite a few persons we need to hug and see there. <laughs> Very thankful to be here. Thank you. This is family, and um, this is really family. Um, as um, Roger was saying earlier, when we came in 2003, uh, when I came after Stefan has, had arrived, uh, when he was telling me over the phone not to cry, because we were um, getting ready, I was getting ready to come here and leaving my work, my family. I've been living for 12 years at that point in Switzerland, which has been the longest time in my life in any country, um, because I've been um, traveling quite a bit as a young girl and a child in Arab-speaking countries. And so I was really getting very comfortable in Switzerland, not wanting to move away. And, um, <coughs> pardon. Um, so to leave um, Switzerland was really uh, uh, difficult for me. And as I was crying over the phone, to, um, with, I mean, Stefan was here already, I was telling him, how will we ever be able to feel at home uh, in a place where we don't know anyone, where we have to start all over again? Um, I don't have a job there. I will be you know, a student's wife. Um, um, yeah, I mean, how, how will that happen? How are we going to even build a home? as newlyweds, and when Stefan said, don't cry, Sandra, they are, uh, um, they are persons that I've met at uh, Sunday school, at church, and they have decided to adopt us for whatever reason, <laughs> and uh, they want to bless us uh, with a truck full of, um, like for this man maybe that we, you, you have been t telling about, Dorothy, mm -hmm. just everyday items, but really a, a whole household actually, from fork and knife to bed linens to couch, everything. And so as he told me that, you know, trying to encourage me, like, you know, God is providing, why are you crying? And, and what's going on with you, Sandra? Um, I, I stopped crying and I said, who are these people? I don't know them. What do they want from us? <laughs> and he said, what do you mean, what do they want from us? I said, well, this is, I've never heard of such an act of <laughs> kindness and generosity towards strangers. Why would they do that? And, um, and I, I don't know, I did not know anyone. I did not know the Nazarene Church at all, other than maybe having met um, one or two persons in France um, from the Nazarene Church. Um, but I did not know you. I did not know your faces and your hearts. And so I was very, very, uh, how to say it? I was not trusting it. I was like, this is very strange. And, and I said, I don't know if I can. I, how can we accept this, Stefan? It's not possible. Why would they do this? I kept asking, why would they do this? And um, he said, Sandra, they are doing it because they are Christians. And um, it made me cry and realize that when God sends you somewhere, he also equips you. And this was my biggest faith lesson, to know that, God, you are calling me into a foreign country. And I was really scared to come to America. Um, let alone going to Africa later, and then now going back to Europe. I'm also scared of that. <laughs> and so, uh, but you made uh, this place, this foreign place, home for us in many ways. And so, um, it's not about us, as you know, and we know it as well. It's really about God that has brought us together. And it's really a family celebration. As I look um, into many faces, our paths have crossed in many ways. And we have enriched each other's life, I hope. But you have enriched our lives for sure. And uh, I'm thankful that our family is growing <laughs> uh, with new brothers and sisters. Um, and uh, I'm very, very thankful for that. Five months ago, we moved to the Eurasia region, which goes from the UK to um, uh, Russia, more or less, huh? Russia, um, India, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Middle East, Egypt, that's the Eurasia region. And we have been <coughs> asked to serve on that region. Um, last year, our director for the Eurasia region, Dr. Snyders, um, wrote an email to Dr. Chambo from the Africa region and asked him if he could contact us because he, he thought it would be good to contact Stefan 
but he wanted to ask for permission before contacting us directly. And Dr. Chambo said, no, <laughs> no, <clears throat> they're happy where they are, we're happy with them, and that's it. And uh, Dr. Chambo told us that the Holy Spirit prompted him not to say no, but to forward this email to us. So he did forward this email. We were very surprised because, you know, we could, is, we could see ourselves um, retiring in Africa. Um, this, big, this, place, this scary place became home. I mean, it's a big continent, Africa, but this is our family, as you are our family. And many brothers and sisters on the African continent have, have grown be, to be when, dear to us. When you say scary place, I think all the places in the world can be scary. Yes, <laughs> it's true. And the truth is, we are born in a place where we are born in a war zone. Um, the world is a war zone. I mean, not now. It was already before. <coughs> has always been um, um, in a war zone in the way that um, God's Spirit, uh, God's Spirit, Holy Spirit, is fighting for our lives and for us to be uh, with Him and to choose Him. And so it's nothing new. We should not be scared. Um, but you know, when you look with your human eyes, you see, you you hear rumors of war, and you see people displaced and angry people and and scared people. So um, it's true that the world is not um, a restful place, but uh, we know that we can have rest in the Lord. But all this to say that um, when we received this email, we were very surprised. And so Dr. Chambo, Philemon Chambo spoke with us and said, I forwarded this email to you, but I'm sure the Holy Spirit will tell you not to leave, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, Philemon, how can we say no? I mean, how can we promise you we will not leave? You have forwarded this email to us. Now we are to pray about it, you know. And sure enough, Stefan prayed about it. But for me, I was like, I'm not going to pray about it for two weeks. I don't want to. I want. I don't want to leave Africa. And so for two weeks, I was just not not wanting to know what God thinks about it. But I knew in my heart that it was a direction, a possible direction. And so when I finally um, decided to to um, to pray about it. Um, I realized that I was actually scared to go back um, to Europe because we would be living in Europe. And um, I knew that it would be a good time to come closer to our human family. Uh, my mother and father are in Switzerland, my brother and his two little ones. Uh, Stefan's mom is in France, so we're really very, very close in terms of you know driving a few hours and being there. And so um, um, it, it made sense on the human side, but I wanted to be sure that the Lord was really calling us there. And, um, and I realized that um, I was becoming, um, how would you say, just being blessed in being in Africa. And so for me to go back to Germany, we live by the Swiss border, I thought it was interesting that when I uh, came to America in 2003, so 14 years ago, uh, as a newlywed, that I always wanted to go back to Switzerland. So I kept saying to Stefan, right, we're going back to Switzerland after seminary. And he said, you know, I cannot promise you that. I cannot promise you that, Sandra. Remember, we have to stay open to God. And so now that we are almost, you know, we are five minutes away by foot to the Swiss border, I'm like, I don't want to go back to Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really interesting how God, you know, shapes us and, and um, opens our hearts. And when God is uh, with us, Anywhere is home, actually. And I should say this myself now, as we are returning back to Europe. And we have been welcomed, in fact, in, in a very, very gracious way by our brothers and sisters at the regional office in Büsingen, uh, this little German village um, by the Swiss border, um, but also by the churches in Germany that have seen us um, and interacted <coughs> with us the, the last few years as we were visiting and, and um, being with them on deputation. So we have a family there as well. It's just, it's just not home yet, um, but we know that um, we have been prepared in Africa. If we would have gone directly from seminary to Europe, as our maybe plan was at the beginning, at least my plan, <laughs> I don't know if it's different, <laughs> but uh, my plan, uh, it would not have been the same. I think, um, as someone said, Africa is like a, a mother. Um, she never lets you go away empty-handed. And the same African brother, Danny Gomez, said, uh, Africa is actually like a grandmother. Um, when she raises you up, raises you up, she sends you back to your mother. 
And I thought, this is beautiful. Uh, many African grandmas take care of their grandchildren, and then, you know, when the time is um, ripe, they go back to be with their moms. And so it was interesting for us that Africa really um, has helped us to be who we are today uh, on our journey. It started in America, Africa, and now back to Europe. After 10 years, I think, by God's grace, um, um, we have been stretched in many ways. And I keep the rubber bands that uh, Verla Lambert has uh, sent to me and uh, has prepared for me over the years, the rubber band that you stretch. And we are to be stretched. Um, and uh, sometimes we think it, we are done being stretched, but God continues to stretch us very kindly and gently. And um, he does not stretch us to hurt us, but really to fill us with himself. And hopefully, by stretching us, stretching our vision of the world, our perspective of him, um, that he can fill us with even more of him, and less of us, I hope. So, But thank you for being um, the ones who stretch us first, um, to allow us to see who God is, and um, how he has been at work in your lives has also blessed us. Um, thank you for being his faithful servants, and uh, thank you for being our brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> With the time remaining, because time flies always, <laughs> I have two things or three I would like to share. The first one, to help you understand what is the journey of a young atheist to become a Christian. And then, the second part, I will briefly describe the kind of ministry we are doing now in Eurasia, learning, and we'll introduce our sister Audrey, uh, who will perhaps join us at least for our first trip of exploration in Bangladesh for developing education in Bangladesh. So I will start first by saying I was in a class one time with Dr. Tom Noble on holiness. And a well-intentioned well lady in the classroom began to say, I hope I would have been an atheist so that I would have understood better the Christian faith. It's the only time in my studies at MTS I got angry. I looked at her, I said, you don't know what you're speaking about. You don't know the despair you're speaking about. Do you want to be close to, to suicide out of despair? Is it what you want? And I had to shut down because I realized she didn't have any idea what she was speaking about. I would like to share with you a little bit what it was for me to grow up and what hope, what good news I received from God and what changed in my life. Today I'm a teacher or loving education and here you have many people loving education. I did not grow up enjoying education. As I was four years old, a kid in France, you got to school in France when you're three years old. I, begin, I began to be bullied almost every day. I feel through the years I'm almost 50, I can begin to speak about that kind of stuff because I hope it will help some of you to understand the kind of journey either for some or for some dear ones who have gone through similar things. And what bullying did in me is it began to create a sense of paralysis fear in front of aggressivity. Anyone aggressive would make me paralyzed. I began to hate school. My only hope is that my mother or father would get me out of school. When I realized my father did not know how to fight, he was a Jew coming from Tunisia, and he had learned to survive, not to fight. And he, made a, uh, he became a general practitioner in France, married my mother, and when I shared with my mother, she said, I cannot get you out of school. I have to work. <coughs> in her case, during the Second World War, you know during wars that the families are destroyed often. In the family of my mother, her father went with another mother. So my grandma died out of despair. And my mother had made a point that she would never leave her job, even if she was with a husband she loved dearly. So she said, Stefan, there is no way I can leave my job. So I began to shut my communication channels with my parents, with the people around, and I grew up a bitter young man, looking nice outside, but unable to communicate. 
I had no friends. In my youth, when I see people, kids playing together, I don't have these memories. Mm. And it's, it's different. And when I was 12 years old, I was so feeling alone, so feeling in failure, that I began to let hatred rule in my heart. I decided I would prove to the world I was able to make it. So when I was 12 years old, I decided I would succeed in one way, school. And I needed the help of my mother because I hated homework. <laughs> <laughs> homework was like bringing horror, horror and painful stories at home. So I never did my homework. <laughs> and when I was 12 years old, the teacher at school realized I had had three zeros out of 20 in one day. So she decided I should go to do an apprenticeship for repairing TVs because I would never go through school. And my mother decided she has to battle. So every day she began to check with me <laughs> that I had done my homework. And sometimes I did not do exactly what was in my book for homework. So we, she would check the book and make sure I would do my homework. I was not a good student in languages, in literature. I was good in mathematics. But the, I was good enough in mathematics for the math teacher to help me stay in class. And I learned to survive this environment. I became an engineer in robotics. But I had only one problem. I was alone. My world was a trapped world where I did not know how to communicate with people alone outside. And this journey began to be changed when I watched a movie, The Mission, where in this movie, some of you have heard about it, it spoke of love. A love which is stronger than anything else. If I speak all the languages of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is patient, love is kind. Through this movie, it's like if it stuck me in my heart, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for power to impress. I was preparing to develop, to become an engineer specialized in robotics, doing research in artificial vision. And I realized what I want is not really to succeed and to impress people. What I want is love. Then I memorized the text in this movie. I went to even buy the first time a Bible. I never touched a Bible. I was 20 years old. I never saw, I never went to church. I was with no contact. If you had asked me what is the Trinity, I would have said to you, con convinced I was clever, it must be Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. <laughs> that would have been my pick. And in the laboratory department, there was a young woman. I liked her. It was not Sandra. She was fi this lady who was finishing her PhD, and I wanted to date her. But I had not a lot of people skills, as you can imagine. So I wrote a nice poem, and she said, if you want, you can meet me. And I had a bad surprise. The meeting I was invited in was a Christian meeting. I liked the girl. I did not like the meeting. But you know what? Like many young men, I decided I will stay for a while. But through the journey, I realized step by step, in a painful way, because of course, I wanted this young woman to love me. She ne never loved me. At one point, it was so painful that in my heart, there was like an explosion. All as I wanted to love and to be loved, the wounds of the past that I had hidden for 12 years, I did not cry between 12 and 24 years old. It's like if a bomb exploded in my heart. I began to walk one day and I uh, burst in tears with the memories of pains, of wounds, of humiliations being spit at, with the smell that it has when many kids spit at you. And I began to cry uncontrollably. I went to hide in a little chapel I was close to. And for quite a while, I would cry without understanding what's going on. And I began even a psychological therapy because I thought I was getting crazy. <laughs> but step by step, the crying stopped or diminished. This lady did not love me. But slowly, I discovered the faith in God. I prayed one time the Our Father as a scientist. You know, a scientist, what they do? They do experiments. So I experimented with prayer. So one evening, I prayed the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. 
And I noticed that I went to sleep much more easily. In general, my habit, in my case, was one or two hours of sweating in my bed, turning side and side, imagining how I would be a superhero, crushing the ones who were aggressive toward me, which I never were able to do. After praying, I realized I was at peace. And when I woke up, I realized I did not struggle to get to sleep. You do an experiment, you have a good result. As a scientist, what do you do? You reproduce the experiment. And I began to pray. You can imagine it was not a very deep theology yet. I had quite, quite a way to go, but that was a very good start. At one point, realizing this young lady would not love me, I was in depression at that time. I was thinking, I will please God by becoming a monk. I had a ring to become a monk. Mm -hmm. And when I came to Switzerland to study theology, where very soon I would meet the woman God had prepared for me, but I needed to do, go through a journey before being ready, I met a teacher in Switzerland, Johannan Goldman, who was a Jew, so I could relate to him, who became a Christian, and who was a teacher of Old Testament. And one thing I could see in his classes, he loved scripture, mm -hmm. and he loved God. This was perspirating all what he would do. I began to be in contact with him. And one day he told me something which made me very angry. He said to me, Stefan, I shared with him I wanted to be a monk, that I was already reading Thomas Aquinas and memorizing ta 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 ta. He said, Stefan, it seems to me you need to put the foundations of Christianity be before thinking about all these questions of mi ministry, it would be good you just relax in the love of God. Oh. I did not like it. I hated it. Oh. Because it's like he was saying, saying to me, you, you don't get it. <laughs> the truth is I was not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> but step by step, I realized he was right. And he became my mentor, helping me. <coughs> a Catholic priest, born as a Jew, who was a married man in the Catholic Church. Go imagine that, okay? <laughs> it's a Melkite church, and he became a friend who walked along me. And one time he shared with me about John Wesley, because this Catholic priest was reading about John Wesley and found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. One time he gave me a <laughs> biography of John Wesley written by Mathieu Lelièvre, a French Methodist of the beginning of the 20th century. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. We have had Methodists in France. It's just to survive in our Environment is not very easy. So most of the Methodist churches have died in France. And we are in a tough setting in, uh, around Paris. And when I read the story of John Wesley, I was deeply touched. I was not very good at relationships yet. Not ready to have a girlfriend yet. Because I needed to realize that when you have been trapped in yourself for so long, you have not learned all the relational, skill, relational skills that other people have. I did not have them. I did not say, know how to say hi to someone. I was full of anxieties, fears, stress, and my vision would be blurred in the basic relationships of life. So I needed to go one step at a time. <coughs> and one of the things which happened when I read the life of John Wesley, I saw, I read the story of how he would preach in the streets. Oh my, in my heart, I had a vision of myself preaching in the middle of the little town of Switzerland, <laughs> Fribourg, in the street. Me, this terrified young man who could not even handle normal interactions with people in a very good way. I was not very happy with this vision. First, it was very sweet to me. And then, like many things I did in the past, I, would, I pushed it down under to forget about it. You know how we do that sometimes? We sense God wants us to do something, and we are not ready, and we do as if nothing happened. Oh. Have you ever done that kind of stuff? And at one point, my teacher was speaking to me about the love of God. One night, I remember I was reading a Frenchman in Switzerland, reading the King James Version Bible in my bed. That's weird. That's not a common one. And I began to feel the love of God pouring in my heart. In such a way, I had tears. I prayed for the people who had wounded me. I rejoiced. 
it was a key moment in my life to experience that God loves me, that God loves me. That was a key element for the healing I needed to receive. I forgave the people who had wounded me. And then I thought, I want to never forget this night. I cried, I laughed, I sang, I thought my, I was in a house with four other students. I think perhaps they have thought I was a little bit crazy for this night. <laughs> I never discussed with them the afterward. <coughs> but one thing I remembered, I want to never forget this thing. I want to never forget that God loves me. So I had one thing very simple I did. I began to let my beard grow. And I said, Lord, it want, I want this to be a reminder that you love me. And since then, then I carry the beard. Let's be honest, I can shave it. The love of God does not go away. <laughs> and ladies, if you want to be sure of the love of God, there are other ways, OK? <laughs> You don't need this one. <laughs> but for me, it was a practical way to say, God, I don't want to forget how much I've experienced. Listen to the word. I've experienced your love. The whole Wesleyan foundation, the whole holiness movement is grounded on the experience of God's love on walking in this experience, not a one time, but an encounter in which we walk. And I experienced God's love. Then I took the risk to share with, I began to feel I'm more at ease with evangelicals than with Catholics. I moved and I shared with them one time that I felt their way to evangelize in the street, distributing little leaflets was not very efficient. It was not. <laughs> I said to them, why don't one of you preach in the streets? Uh -oh. <laughs> and I was with a friend who said, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't you speak to the pastor about it? And then he spoke to the pastor who said, we wanted to have an evangelism choir for Christmas. And I ended up being the choir director. <laughs> if you have heard me sing, I don't sing very well. And I was not singing at all in tune, but I became the choir director of an evangelism choir in the streets of Fribourg. And after three years, we ended up invited by the city to sing evangelistic songs exactly at the place where I had the visions three or four years before. It became a street preaching or evangelism is not a common thing here. Imagine in Switzerland. <laughs> but God used it to bless people. And then my surprising teacher, Johanan Goldman, said, Stefan, I'm reading stuff about the holiness movement. I feel they are touching a very important point of theology. The fact that being filled with the Spirit is not about any manifestations outside. It's first about a purification of the heart, which enables us to be closer to God. And he said, wait, I find a book which is a good description, and I will give it to read. I read, it was uh, an old book, not new books of uh, NPH. It was beginning of the 20th century, Lessons for Seekers of Holiness. I love these old holiness books uh, by Harmon Allen Baldwin. And simple description, invitation to prayer. And when I prayed, I felt a peace, a purity I did not know before. I came to my teacher. I said, Yohanan. And he said, could you pray for me? I prayed with him. And he said, let's check that what you experience is not off base. Let's see if you have people in the world today who still believe this strange message. Then he looked on internet, found that there is a big denomination, big, small, whatever the size you want to describe. There is a Nazarene denomination, which is the biggest denomination out of the holiness movement. Got in contact with Buzingen through emails, where they, have a, they had a little Bible school. And that's where I met the first Nazarenes. And I felt. And we were saying together, let's see if they are still holding to this message of heart holiness or the, if they have forgotten in the hundred years and if we should go back and just uh, forget about it. And we were happy to say that they were still preaching and witnessing this heart holiness we are speaking about. Heart holiness is about love, being loved and loving in return. The problem is often people have not experienced God's love. Mm -hmm so that they have big ideas, but little feet. It's a faith which does not move much. And 
as I took contact with the Church of Nazarene, I felt it's the place where God wants me to minister. So my way, I'm, I'm critical. I've, I'm not saying things to be nice, you know. The, sometimes I say, in America, when you want to say a critical point, you give the first three nice points. In France, we are almost the same. We just remove the three, nine points, the three ni <laughs> nice points. <laughs> so I came to Kansas City to see the Nazarene Church after one year of trial. And in this journey, being late for not making it to come to NTS, it was a tool God used because in the process, I had met a young girl who was the woman God wanted for me, Sandra. But she did, was not in a rush to marry me. <laughs> she noticed I had some issues with communication. <laughs> she was interested by my journey from atheism to faith, but when she tried to interact with me, she realized there are some weird things. She would make me meet friends, I would shake the hands, and I would look at my shoes. Not two seconds, minutes. And then she thought he's weird. <laughs> so for years, we became friends. And it was difficult for me because the passion of a young man. Today, we speak always of sexuality, of having boys and girls going in together, but they don't learn relationships often. And the relationship is an art. We learn to listen to the other to hear what the other likes, to learn to please the other kindly, to interact, to develop friendship. And what we want is passion, and we wonder why it does not work. Well, in my case, I can tell you it was not working at all. <laughs> I was a mess, and I needed time to learn what it means to be friends with men, to have friends with whom I could discuss in a way where I did not try just to crush their arguments, I like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I was good at that so that my friends were not very happy with me. <laughs> so I had to learn that it's not a matter of proving you're better than the other, but hearing the other. Debating is not about being more clever, but developing relationships and learning together. It took time. It took years. It took a lot of time, and slowly, with Sandra, who accepted to be my friend, at one point she accepted to be my girlfriend. I thought, that's it, let's marry, because my, I wanted to marry Sandra. So I said, Sandra, do you want to marry me? She told me, wait. <laughs> I was not that skilled in relationships, you know, and I guess she could feel something about it, but I did not know how much I had to wait. I needed to wait five years. Where Sandra, when Sandra would become at peace. Did she need a journey in her heart? She had a journey to do on her own also. But the truth is God used it for my journey to develop a real relationship. We're speaking of holiness, my friends. Mm -hmm. Holiness is about relationships. And the relationship is about two-way communication and how we learn to listen to each other, how we learn to care for each other. It's true for humans, it's true with God. And if you hear me more, you will hear me speak of listening to God. Because without listening, our theological holiness it remains very abstract. Mm -hmm. Our heart relationship needs this flow of dialogue. And as with Sandra, we moved, we married, and I've been blessed to have Sandra as my wife, who is very sensitive to others, so that I would not be wounded when I would open up, that she would be gracious, even if some weird stuff came out. <laughs> and, and some came out sometimes. And we have learned to be friends, to walk alongside, and it's a joy to be with Sandra and to minister with Sandra. And in case you, you, you don't realize, she has played a huge part in me becoming more human, in learning to relate to people. If you, I did not tell it to you, perhaps you will not realize how paralyzed, terrified, unable to speak or to communicate with people. I remember being 18 years old, I was going in uh, stairs with one of my colleagues at school, and I did, would not shake hands, I would not say hi, I would put my head down when I would see people. And he said, you're so stupid. And I hated it, of course. But later I thought, you know what? He was right. 
I was stupid. But I needed someone to love me, to help me. First it was God, then some human people, Johannan Goldman, this dear friend, mm -hmm. Sandra, and slowly I became normal, and I become now a missionary mm -hmm. of God's love. Mm -hmm. In this world, being in Eurasia, having learned to love school while I hated school, mm -hmm. I have three masters now, and we are training people for ministry. Isn't it amazing what God can do? in our foolishness. I would like not to take more time now because I would like to say in Eurasia, one of the big challenges is that in Bangladesh, we have about more than 3,000 churches. We have no ma bachelor in theology and our pastoral education is in the restart mode. Major challenges. You can imagine thousands of churches, thousands of pastors, and we need to build a team of educators because education is very important. You know that. To train the pastors to be ready to be good ministers of the gospel. And in the last year or so, we have been in contact with a dear, dear young lady which is, who is here, Audrey, and we are in the process of discerning how she could be at our side for helping for this education in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. She will come in September for a first trip she w perhaps will not want me to say that, but she needs to raise uh, funds for this first trip. So if the Lord puts on your heart, know that uh, she will be in September in Bangladesh. And Audrey, I would like to, that you share a word about how God put on your heart mm. to move in this direction. Would it be okay? Sure. Um. <coughs> Good morning. I guess I'd like to take this opportunity to first say thank you for your prayers and encouragement along this journey. Um, for those who don't know me, I've had a call to mission since I was about 13 years old. Um, and meeting these dear friends has opened a whole new chapter of my life with the Lord, um, knowing that the Holy Spirit speaks to us and leads us every day. is something that can sound so simple for a child to understand. But taking that into faith um, and then Stepping into unknowns with that has opened um, a world of possibilities, and it's been humbling to see how that changes lives every day and also through long-term friendships, and one is in Bangladesh. I went to high school with a girl from Bangladesh. She was my mom's student, and um, just for Bangladesh specifically, um, it's just been humbling and an honor to journey with a family there um, and kind of learning about a people. I was in a place of life and major depression when I went there for the first time um, about a couple years ago. Um, the Lord was using that time a way to bring peace and rebirth to my spiritual life and in the midst of a community where my connection with Christians was very, very limited, um, I saw the Lord and in the midst of what we see as outside the church walls. Mm -hmm. And so um, to kind of keep it short, um, it's just been a challenge that the Lord has used the rubber band analogy to stretch me and saying, will you listen and will you follow me and not hold on to everything in your hands? And so a lot of my journey has been just um, saying yes and an open obedience saying, it might sound crazy or it might be something simple for what I can do today where I am or where the Lord can take me. Um, but having that open obedience has open doors. And in Bangladesh, there are some very passionate people um, in our Church of Nazarene. Um, there are young couples that I've met um, that are just seeking in how to honor God and serve him in the midst of this need and how God is at work. Um, one of the struggles, I'll keep it short, I know we're running short on time, but one of the struggles of not having enough pastors for the churches is also that um, a lot of the pastors are going back to working in the fields, even if they're not educated. So then the congregations are then returning to their formal beliefs and ways of life as well. So there's a lot of uh, complexity in the struggle. So I would say if you can be praying for the education, but also the heart, the heart change of the people in Bangladesh and the Eurasia field, um, that would be a huge blessing. Thank you, Audrey. Yes, thank, you. thank you very much. Would we finish by a word of prayer together? Lord Jesus, you know the depth of our foolishness. We can play games with people, but we have so much to learn from you, the master of love. Holy Spirit, teach us, 
each of us, you know our journey in this learning to love where we are at now. Bless my friends that together we can move one step closer to you, to your heart of love, of peace, of purity, of holiness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time you gave us together today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May God bless you. I have some prayer cards. If you'd like some prayer cards. Um, okay, be at the back door. And okay. I will yeah, give them there. And one neat little detail is um, when Stefan was telling about um, <clears throat> having gone to Busingen, where he met the Nazarene church for the first time in Germany, that little village um, at the Bible college there. It was in 2002. And now, so now 15 years later, we are back at that very same spot where Stefan met the Nazarenes for the first yes. time, in that same village. It's in that, the building is still there. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to see how, you know, God sends you, like he calls you 15 years later, you go, you wander around maybe sometimes, and then you come back and uh, very, very thankful. God is amazing. Yes. May you discover uh, his continuous plan in your own lives. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for sharing thank your you. heart with us. Thank, thank you. you.